Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of CatholicCulture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, Life of St. Anthony, by St. Athanasius of Alexandria, translated by Sister Mary Emily Keenan, SCN, narrated by James T. Majewski. You have entered into a noble contest with the monks of Egypt in undertaking to equal or surpass them in your training in the way of virtue. For now there are monasteries in your midst, and the name of monk is publicly esteemed. It is right, therefore, that everyone should praise your purpose. May God fulfill it in answer to your prayers. You have asked me for an account of the Blessed Anthony's way of life, because you wish to learn how he began the practice of asceticism what he was prior to it, how he died, and whether or not the things told of him are true, in order to train yourselves to zealous imitation of him. Most willingly have I accepted the task you imposed. Indeed, merely to call Anthony to mind is of great profit to me, and I know that, when you have heard about him, you will not content yourselves with admiring the man, but you will also wish to imitate his way of life. For the life of Anthony is, for monks, an adequate guide in asceticism. Do not hesitate to believe what you have heard from those who have brought you accounts of him. Believe, rather, that they have told but little, for they certainly cannot have recounted all the details of his life. Even I, since you have urged me, notwithstanding all that I shall relate in my letter, shall be writing but a few of the things I have remembered about him. Therefore. Do not cease questioning those who sail from these shores, for it is probable that, when each one has told what he knows, the account will not do Anthony justice. For this reason, I had a mind, when I received your letter, to send for some of the monks, especially those who used to be with him most constantly, so that I might learn further details and send you a more complete account. The sailing season was closing, however, and the letter carrier was pressing me, so I have hastened to write for your reverent consideration both what I myself know, for I saw him often, and what I was able to learn from him, since I attended him no little time and served him personally. In all the details, I have been concerned solely about the truth, so that no one may be incredulous when he hears further details, nor, on the other hand, think less of the man because he has heard so little about him. Anthony was an Egyptian by birth, His parents were well-born and possessed considerable means, and since they were Christians, he too was brought up a Christian. As a young child, he was reared by his parents, knowing no one but them and his home, and when he grew to boyhood and adolescence, he refused to attend school because he wished to avoid the companionship of other children. His whole desire was, as is written of Jacob, to dwell a plain man in his house. He used to frequent the church with his parents and was very attentive as a child. As he grew older, he was respectful and obedient to his parents, and by paying close attention to passages read aloud, he carefully preserved for himself what was profitable in them. Although he had a moderately wealthy home, as a boy he did not trouble his parents for a variety of costly foods nor seek enjoyment in eating, but he was content solely with what he found and asked for nothing more. The death of his parents, when he was eighteen or twenty years old, left him with the responsibility of a very young sister, as well as of their home. Scarcely six months had passed since his parents' death, when, going to the church, as was his custom, he thoughtfully reflected as he walked along how the apostles, leaving all things, followed the Savior, and how the faithful in the acts of the apostles, selling their possessions, brought the price of what they had sold and laid it at the apostles' feet for distribution among the needy. And he considered how great was the hope laid up for them in heaven. Pondering on these things, he entered the church. It happened that the gospel was then being read, and he heard the Lord saying to the rich man, If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come. 
follow me. As though God had inspired his thought of the saints and the passage had been read aloud on his account, Anthony left the church at once and gave to the villagers the property he had received from his parents. There were three hundred acres, fertile and very beautiful, so that he and his sister might not be in any way encumbered by it. He sold all their other worldly possessions and collected a large amount of money, which he gave to the poor, keeping a little for his sister's sake. On another occasion, as he was going into the church, he heard the Lord saying in the gospel, Do not be anxious about tomorrow. He could remain no longer, but went out and gave even this to the needy. Later, entrusting his sister to virgins who were well known and faithful, he placed her in a convent to be brought up, and then devoted himself to the practice of asceticism not far from his own house, watching over himself strictly and patiently training himself. Monasteries were not yet as common in Egypt, and no monk knew the great desert, but anyone who wished to attend to his soul practiced the ascetical life alone, not far from his own village. Thus, there was in the neighboring village at the time an old man who had lived a solitary life from his youth. Upon seeing him, Anthony endeavored to equal him in virtue. So he, too, began to stay in the places near the village at first. If he heard of a zealous person anywhere else, he went forth from there like a wise bee and sought him out and did not return to his own place until he had seen him. After he had taken from him supplies, as it were, for traveling the road to virtue, he returned. Here, then, he went through the first stages of the ascetical life, carefully weighing his resolution not to return to his inheritance and not to recall his kindred, and directing his whole desire and all his energies to strengthening his spiritual practices. He labored with his hands, therefore, because he heard, If any man will not work, neither let him eat, spending a part for bread and a part on the needy. He prayed continually, because he had learned that one must pray in secret without ceasing. He paid such close attention to what he heard read that nothing escaped him, but he remembered everything, his memory later serving him instead of books. Training himself in these ways, Anthony was loved by all. He was sincerely subject to the devout men whom he visited, and closely observed for himself the zeal and self-denial which each had acquired. He noticed the courtesy of one, the constancy of another in prayer. He observed one's meekness, another's kindness. He attentively watched one as he kept vigil, and another in his love of study. He admired one for his patience, another for his fasting and sleeping on the ground. He watched closely the gentleness of one and the forbearance of another, while in all he noted their devotion to Christ and their love one for another. Having thus gathered his fill, he returned to his own place of solitude, reflecting thereafter on the special virtues of each one and striving eagerly to exemplify all of them in himself. He was not given to emulating persons his own age, yet he took care that they should not surpass him in the higher things. He did this in such a way as to offend no one, but rather caused everyone to rejoice in him. All the villagers, therefore, and all the lovers of the good who knew him, seeing what he was, called him dear to God. Some cherished him as a son, others as a brother. The devil, however, in his envy and hatred of the good, could not bear to see such steadfastness in a young person, and attempted to use against him the methods in which he is skilled. He first tried to draw him away from the ascetical life, by suggesting the memory of his property, anxiety about his sister, intimacy with his kindred, greed for money and for power, the manifold enjoyment of food and the other pleasures of life, and finally, the rigor of virtue and the great labor it entailed. He also hinted at the weakness of the body and the duration of time. In a word, he gathered up in his mind a great dust cloud of arguments, wishing to withdraw him from his upright purpose. When, however, the enemy saw that he was powerless against Anthony's resolution, and that, instead, he was himself being defeated by Anthony's firmness and overthrown by his great faith, and that he was not succeeding because of Anthony's continuous prayers, he then placed his confidence in the weapons in the navel of his belly, 
glorying in them, for they are his first snares against the young and advanced against the youth. He troubled him by night and disquieted him so by day that even onlookers noticed the struggle that was taking place between the two. He suggested filthy thoughts. Anthony turned them away by his prayers. He aroused carnal feelings, but Anthony, blushing in shame, fortified his body by faith, by prayers, and by fastings. The contemptible enemy even dared to assume the appearance of a woman at night, imitating her every gesture solely to deceive Anthony. But he extinguished the burning oil of that illusion by meditating on Christ and reflecting on the nobility that is ours through Christ and on the spiritual nature of the soul. Again, the enemy suggested the softness of pleasure, but Anthony, in anger and grief, pondered on the threat of punishment by fire and the torment of the worm, and, after weighing them against his temptations, came through them unharmed. All this but added to the confusion of the enemy, for he who considered himself like to God was now mocked by a youth, and he who exulted over flesh and blood was routed by a man clad in flesh. For the Lord was assisting him, the Lord who took flesh for us and gave the body victory over the devil, so that all who truly strive can say, Not I, but the grace of God with me. Finally, when the serpent was unable to overthrow Anthony by such means, and even saw himself driven out of his heart, he gnashed his teeth, as it is written, and as though driven to frenzy, he next came to Anthony as a blackened boy, his appearance matching his mind. He fawned upon Anthony, as it were. He no longer assailed him with thoughts, for, deceitful as he was, he had been cast out. This time adopting a human voice, he said, I have deceived many, and I have overthrown many. Yet now, when I attacked you and your works, as I have attacked others, I was powerless. Anthony then asked, Who are you who say such things to me? And at once he uttered a contemptible speech. I am a lover of fornication. I have undertaken to ensnare the young and entice them to it, and I am called the spirit of fornication. How many I have deceived who wished to be chaste, how many who practiced self-restraint have I by my seductions persuaded to change? I am he on whose account the prophet reproaches the fallen, saying, You have been deceived by the spirit of fornication. For through me they were tripped up. I am he who often troubled you, but whom you as often overthrew. But Anthony thanked God, and, taking courage against his adversary, said, you are then thoroughly despicable, for your mind is black and you are as weak as a child. Henceforth I shall have no concern about you, for the Lord is my helper and I will despise my enemies. At this the evil one immediately fled, cringing at his words, fearing even to approach the man again. This was Anthony's first victory over the devil, or rather, this was the triumph in Anthony, of the Savior who has condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Anthony did not become negligent, however, nor did he act presumptuously, as if the devil were under his power. Neither did the enemy cease laying snares as though worsted, for again he went about like a lion, seeking some occasion against him. But Anthony, who had learned from the scriptures that the enemy's wiles are numerous, persevered earnestly in his asceticism. He realized that, even if the enemy had not been able to seduce his heart with bodily pleasures, he would undoubtedly try to ensnare him by other means, because the devil is a lover of sin. More and more, then, he chastised his body and brought it into subjection, lest, after triumphing in some matters, he should be dragged down in others. He therefore determined to accustom himself to a more rigorous way of life. People marveled at him, but he easily endured the hardship, for the eagerness of his spirit had become so a part of him that it was habitual. 
he would take even an insignificant occasion afforded by others to manifest great zeal in this matter. For he kept such long vigils that often he passed the whole night without sleep, and this not once, it was noted with wonder, but frequently. He used to eat once a day after sunset, sometimes, however, after two days, and frequently even after four. His food was bread and salt, his drink water only. Of meat and wine there is no need even to speak, since nothing of this sort was found among the other holy men. A rush mat served him for sleep, but most of the time he lay on the bare ground. He refused to anoint himself with oil, saying that it was more becoming young men to show readiness in disciplining themselves, and that they should not seek what would enervate the body, but rather accustom it to hardship, remembering the apostle's words, When I am weak, then I am strong. The state of the soul, he said, is vigorous when the pleasures of the body are weakened. He had come to this truly uncommon conclusion. He thought it proper to measure progress in virtue and retirement from the world for the sake of it, not by time, but by earnestness of desire and stability of purpose. Accordingly, he himself took no account of the time which had passed, but day by day, as if beginning his ascetical life anew, he made greater efforts to advance, constantly repeating to himself St. Paul's saying, Forgetting what is behind, I strain forward to what is before. He also recalled the word of the prophet Elias, who said, The Lord liveth before whose face I stand this day. For he observed that in saying, This day, the prophet was not measuring the time which had passed, but daily, as though ever beginning, he endeavored to make himself such as one ought to be to appear before God, pure in heart and ready to submit to his will and to none other. And he used to say to himself that in the life of the great Elias, the ascetic ought always to see his own as in a mirror. Having strengthened himself in this manner, Anthony went out to the tombs that were at some distance from the village. Having requested an acquaintance to bring him bread at long intervals, he entered one of the tombs, and, when the acquaintance had closed the door on him, he remained within, alone. Now the enemy could not endure this. Fearing that in a short time Anthony would fill the desert with his asceticism, he came one night with a throng of demons and cut him so with lashes that he lay on the ground speechless from the intense pain. Anthony declared that the pain was so severe that blows inflicted by men could not have caused him such agony. By the providence of God, however, for the Lord is not unmindful of those who hope in him, his acquaintance arrived the next day, bringing him the loaves. On opening the door, he saw Anthony lying on the ground apparently dead. So he picked him up and brought him to the village church where he laid him on the ground. Many of his kinsmen and the villagers watched beside Anthony as if he were dead. About midnight, however, Anthony awakened, fully conscious, and, when he saw them all sleeping except his companion, he beckoned him to come to him and asked to be lifted again without waking anyone and carried back to the tombs. The man carried Anthony back, and, when the door was closed as before, he was again alone within. He could not stand up because of the blows, but he prayed as he lay there, and after his prayer called out, Here am I, Anthony. I am not going to flee from your blows, for even if you inflict more on me, nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. Then he sang, If camps shall stand against me, my heart shall not fear. These were the ascetic's thoughts and words. But the enemy, a hater of the good, marveled that he had the courage to return after the blows, and, calling together his hounds, he passionately burst forth. You see that neither by the spirit of fornication nor by blows have we made this man cease, but that he even challenges us. Let us attack him in another way. Evil schemes are easy for the devil. During the night, therefore, the demons made such a din that the whole place seemed to be shaken to its foundations. They seemed to break the four walls of the room and to come in through them in the shape of beasts and reptiles. 
and suddenly the place was filled with the forms of lions, bears, leopards, bulls, serpents, asps, scorpions, and wolves, each of which was behaving in its natural manner. The lion kept roaring, ready to attack. The bull seemed to charge with its horns. Though the serpent kept writhing, it never reached him, and the wolf kept checking itself as it rushed at him. The noises of all the apparitions together in the same place were terrible, and their outbursts of fury ferocious. Anthony felt bodily pains even more severe as they scourged and goaded him, yet he lay there, unshaken, more vigilant in spirit than before. He groaned because of the pain of his body, but his mind was clear, and he said to them gaily, If you had any power, it would have been enough for one of you to come. But because the Lord has deprived you of your strength, you therefore try to frighten me by your numbers. That you take the shape of beasts is proof of your weakness. And again he said fearlessly, If you are strong enough, because you have received power against me, do not delay your attack. But if you have no power, why do you needlessly trouble yourselves? For faith in our Lord is a seal and a wall of safety for us. After numerous attempts, therefore, they gnashed their teeth at him, because they were mocking themselves and not him. Now the Lord had thus far not been unmindful of Anthony's conflict, but had been at hand to aid him. Looking up, Anthony saw the roof opening as it were, and a ray of light coming down toward him. Suddenly the demons disappeared, and the pain of his body ceased at once. The building was whole again. Realizing that help was at hand, Anthony recovered his breath again and, being relieved of his pains, questioned the vision there before him. Where were you? Why did you not appear at the beginning to end my pains? I was here, Anthony, a voice answered, but I waited to see your struggle. Because you have remained firm and have not yielded, I will always be your helper and I will make your name known everywhere. Anthony arose and prayed when he heard this, and was so strengthened that he perceived that he had more strength in his body than before. He was then about thirty-five years old. On the following day, Anthony went forth with even greater zeal for the service of God, and, upon meeting the old man mentioned before, asked him to live with him in the desert. The old man declined, because of his age and because such a practice was not as yet customary. So Anthony set off at once for the mountain by himself. Again the enemy saw his zeal and hoped to hinder him. He threw in his path what seemed to be a large silver disc. But Anthony, recognizing the stratagem of the evil one, stood and looked at the disc, and then discomfited the devil in it as he said, how did a disc get here in the desert? This is not a beaten pathway, and there is no trace of travelers here. It could not have fallen unnoticed, for it is very large. But even if it had been lost, the loser would have found it had he turned back to look for it, because the place is a desert. This is a trick of the devil. You shall not hinder my purpose by such means, Satan. Take this thing with thee to perdition. And as Anthony said this, the disc vanished like smoke before the face of fire. Then, as he went on again, he saw in the road not a deceptive image this time, but real gold scattered in the way. Whether the enemy caused it, or whether some higher power was trying the athlete and showing the devil that Anthony really cared nothing for money, he himself did not say, and we do not know. He did say that what appeared was gold. Anthony wondered at the quantity, but passed it by, stepping over it as if it were fire, without even turning back. He ran swiftly on so as to lose sight of the place and to forget its location. Strengthened in his purpose more and more, he went steadily on to the mountain. On the other side of the river, he discovered a fort which had been deserted for so long that it was full of reptiles. He crossed over and settled there. The reptiles immediately left the place as if someone were pursuing them. 
He barricaded the entrance after laying in bread for six months. The Thebans do this, and often it remains unspoiled for a whole year. And since there was water within, he went down as into a shrine and remained there alone for one year. He neither went abroad himself nor saw any of those who came to him. Thus he devoted a long time to the practice of asceticism, receiving bread only twice a year from the room above. Those of his friends who came to him frequently spent the days and nights outside since he did not allow them to enter. They used to hear what sounded like a turbulent crowd within, shouting and shrieking as they screamed, Go away from our dwelling! What have you to do with the desert? You cannot hold out against our snares! At first, those outside thought that there were men who had entered by a ladder struggling with him. But when they looked down through a hole and saw no one, they were alarmed and called to Anthony. He had disregarded the demons, but listened to the men and, coming to the door, advised them to go back home and not to be afraid, for the demons cause exhibitions of this kind against the timid. Make the sign of the cross, he said, and go away boldly, leaving these to make laughing stocks of themselves. So they went away, fortified with the sign of the cross, and he remained and was not harmed by them at all. He did not become weary of the struggle, for the aid of a heavenly vision and the weakness of the enemy brought him great relief from his labors and filled him with greater zeal. His friends used to come regularly, expecting to find him dead, but they would hear him singing, Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered, and let them that hate him flee from before his face. As smoke vanisheth, so let them vanish away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And again, All nations compassed me about, and in the name of the Lord, I have been revenged on them. Part 2 Anthony spent nearly twenty years disciplining himself in this manner, neither going out nor seldom being seen by anyone. As a result, many were eager to imitate his asceticism, and some of his acquaintances came and forcibly broke down the door and removed it. He came forth as from some shrine, like one who had been initiated in the sacred mysteries and filled with the Spirit of God. Then, for the first time, he was seen outside the fort by those who came to him. They were amazed to see that his body was unchanged, for it had not become heavy as from lack of exercise, nor worn from fasting and struggling with the evil spirits. He was just as they had known him before he had secluded himself. The temper of his soul, too, was faultless, for it was neither straitened as if from grief, nor dissipated by pleasure, nor was it strained by laughter or melancholy. He was not disturbed when he saw the crowd, nor elated at being welcomed by such numbers. He was perfectly calm, as befits a man who is guided by reason and who has remained in his natural state. Through him the Lord healed many of those present who were suffering in body, and freed others from evil spirits. The Lord also gave Anthony grace in speech, so that he comforted many who were in sorrow and reconciled those who were at variance, urging all to prefer the love of Christ to anything in the world. And as he conversed with them, exhorting them to remember the good things to come and the love of God for us, who has not spared even his own Son but has delivered him for us all, he induced many to choose the solitary life. So from that time there have been monasteries even in the mountains, and the desert was made a city by monks who had left their own city and enrolled themselves for citizenship in heaven. Once, when Anthony was obliged to cross the canal of the Arsenorites, the occasion was the visitation of the brethren, the canal was full of crocodiles. He simply prayed. Then 
he and all his companions entered it and passed through unharmed. Upon returning to his cell, he continued the same holy and strenuous labors. By frequent conferences, he increased the zeal of those who had already become monks and stirred many others to a love of the ascetical life. And soon there were numerous cells because his speech drew men, and to all of them he acted as a father and a guide. One day, when he went out because all the monks came to him and asked to hear a discourse, he spoke to them as follows in the Egyptian tongue. The scriptures are sufficient for our instruction, yet it is good to encourage one another in the faith and to spur one another on by our words. Like children, then, you relate what you have learned to your father, and I, as your elder, will share with you my knowledge and experience. Let all make this resolution especially, not to give up once we have begun, not to become faint-hearted in our labors, and not to say we have spent a long time in the practice of asceticism. Rather, let us increase our zeal each day as if we were beginning anew, for if measured by the ages to come, the whole of human life is very short, and all our time is as nothing compared with eternal life. In the world, everything is sold at its price, and measure is given for measure. The promise of eternal life, however, is bought for a trifle. For it is written, The days of our years in them are threescore and ten years, but if in the strong they be fourscore years, and what is more of them is labor and sorrow. If, then, we should spend eighty whole years, or even a hundred, in the practice of asceticism, we shall reign not merely for a hundred years, but for ever. Our struggle is on earth, but it is not on earth that we shall receive our inheritance. Our reward is promised in heaven. We put off a corruptible body and receive it back incorruptible. Therefore, children, let us not be faint-hearted, nor think that we have labored a long time, nor that we are doing anything great, for the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that will be revealed in us. Let us not think, as we look at the world, that we have renounced something great, because the whole earth is very small when compared to the whole of heaven. Though we were lords of even the whole earth and gave it all up, it would be as nothing compared to the kingdom of heaven. It is as if a man should disregard one bronze coin in order to gain a hundred gold ones. So, a man who renounces the whole earth, though he be lord of it, gives up little and receives a hundredfold in return. And if the whole earth is not worth the kingdom of heaven, surely he who has left a few fields leaves nothing, as it were. Even if he has given up a house or much gold, he ought not to boast nor grow weary. Moreover, we should consider that, if we do not relinquish these things for virtue's sake, we leave them behind later when we die, and often, as Ecclesiastes reminds us, to those to whom we do not wish to leave them. Why, then, do we not relinquish them for the sake of virtue, so that we may inherit a kingdom? Let none of us, therefore, give entrance to the desire for possessions, for what gain is it to acquire those things which we cannot take with us? Why not rather require those which we can take? Prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, understanding, charity, love of the poor, faith in Christ, gentleness, hospitality. If we obtain these, we shall find them there before us, preparing a welcome for us in the land of the meek. With such thoughts, then, let a man persuade himself not to regard this matter lightly especially if he considers that he himself is a servant of the Lord and owes service to his master. Hence, as a servant would not dare to say, I am not going to work today because I worked yesterday, and he would not refuse to do any work on the following days because he was counting the past, but would daily, as it is written in the Gospel, show the same readiness to please his master and avoid danger, so we too should persevere daily in the practical of asceticism knowing that the Lord will not pardon us for the sake of the past if we are careless for a single day, but will be angry with us because of our negligence. Thus we have heard in Ezekiel, likewise Judas, because of one night, lost all his previous labor. 
Therefore, children, let us hold fast to the practice of asceticism and not grow careless. For in this we have the Lord working with us, as it is written, To all that choose the good, the Lord works with them for good. And in order to avoid negligence, it is well for us to reflect on the Apostle's saying, I die daily. For if we also live as if dying daily, we shall not sin. That is to say, when we wake each day, we should think that we shall not live until evening. And again, when falling asleep, we should think that we shall not awaken. For our life is of its nature uncertain and is measured out to us daily by providence. Living from day to day in such dispositions, we shall neither sin nor desire anything inordinately, nor nurse angry feelings against anyone, nor lay up treasure on earth. But, as if daily expecting to die, we shall be poor and shall forgive everyone everything. We shall not take hold of the desire for women or for any other carnal pleasure, even to conquer it, but we shall turn from it as something we ignore, ever striving and looking forward to the day of judgment. For a greater fear and anxiety concerning the torment of hell always dispels the enticement of pleasure and rouses the languid soul. Now that we have begun and have entered on the way of perfection, let us press on the more so that we may reach the things that lie before. Let no one turn back like Lot's wife, especially since the Lord has said, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. To turn back is nothing other than to change one's purpose and to seek after worldly things again. Do not be fearful when you hear of perfection, nor be surprised at the word, for it is not far from us, nor does it exist outside of us. Perfection is within our reach, and the practice of it is a very easy matter if only we will it. The Greeks go abroad, even crossing the sea to become learned. But we have no need to go abroad for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, nor need we cross the sea for the sake of perfection. The Lord has already told us, The kingdom of God is within you. We need only to will perfection, since it is within our power and is developed by us. For when the soul keeps the understanding in its natural state, perfection is confirmed. The soul is in its natural state when it remains as it was created, and it was created beautifully and exceedingly upright. For this reason, Joshua, the son of Nun, commanded the people, Incline your hearts to the Lord the God of Israel, and John, make straight his paths. Rectitude of soul, then, consists in preserving the intellect in its natural state, as it was created. On the other hand, when the intellect turns aside and deviates from its natural state, the soul is said to be evil. Thus the matter is not difficult. If we remain as we were made, we are in a state of virtue. But if we think evil thoughts, we are accounted evil. If, then, perfection were a thing to be acquired from without, it would indeed be difficult. But since it is within us, let us guard against evil thoughts and let us constantly keep our soul for the Lord as a trust received from Him, so that He may recognize His work as being the same as when He made it. Let us strive not to be ruled by anger nor overpowered by concupiscence, for it is written that, the wrath of man does not work the justice of God, and when passion has conceived, it brings forth sin. But when sin has matured, it begets death. Living thus, let us watch constantly, and, as it is written, keep our heart with all watchfulness, for we have terrible and crafty enemies, the wicked demons, and we wrestle against them, as the apostle said, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness on high. The number of evil spirits in the air around us is great, and they are not far from us. They differ greatly, and much could be said of their nature and of their distinctions, but such an account 
is for others greater than we are. At the present time, however, we need only to know their wiles against us. Therefore, we must first understand that the demons were not created demons, for God made nothing evil. They were created good, but having fallen from heavenly wisdom, they have since then been continually flying about the earth. They deceived the Greeks by apparitions, and, because they envy us who are Christians, they leave nothing unmoved in their desire to keep us from the way to heaven that we may not mount to the place from which they fell. A man has need of much prayer and self-discipline that he may receive from the Spirit the gift of discerning spirits and be able to know their characteristics, which of them are less evil, which more, what is the nature of the special pursuit of each of them, and how each of them is overcome and cast out. They have numerous changes of plots. The blessed apostle and his followers knew this when they said, We are not unaware of his devices. And we, from the temptations we have experienced from them, must, when opposed by them, guide one another. Therefore, I, who have had some experience of them, speak to you as my children. If the evil spirits see each Christian, and especially each monk, laboring cheerfully and making progress, they first attack and tempt by putting snares in the way. Their snares are evil thoughts. We need not fear their suggestions, however, for by prayer and fasting and trust in the Lord, they immediately fail. But even when they have failed, they do not rest, but come back again craftily and deceitfully. When they cannot deceive the heart openly with shameful pleasures, they attack again in another way and set themselves to cause great fear by devising empty images, changing their shapes and taking the form of women, of wild beasts, of reptiles, of gigantic bodies and of troops of soldiers. Even so, we need not fear their phantoms, for they are nothingness and quickly disappear, especially if one fortifies himself with faith and the sign of the cross. Yet they are bold and very shameless, for even if they are overcome, they attack again in another way. They pretend to prophesy and foretell the future, and they appear as tall as the roof and of great width in order to seize stealthily by such phantoms those whom they were unable to ensnare by their arguments. If here also they find the soul strengthened by faith and by the hope of its purpose, they then bring in their leaders. They often appear in that shape in which the Lord revealed the devil to Job when he said, His eyes are as an image of the morning star, out of his mouth go forth burning lamps, and watchfires are shot forth. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke of a furnace burning with a fire of coals. His breath is coals, and flame cometh forth out of his mouth. When the leader of the demons appears in this manner, the crafty one causes terror, as I said, by boasting, as the Lord convicted him of doing when he said to Job, for he shall esteem iron as straw, and brass as wrought in wood, and he thought the sea an unguent box, and the infernal regions of the abyss as captive, and the abyss as a place for walking. And by the prophet, the enemy said I will pursue and overtake, and again by another prophet, I shall seize the whole world in my hand as a nest, and as eggs that are left, I shall take it up. In a word, such are the things they try to boast and to proclaim, so that they may deceive the devout. But again, we the faithful must not fear his phantoms nor heed his words, for he lies and never speaks a word of truth. Although he talks and boasts of so many great things, he was drawn by the hook, like a dragon by the Savior and received the halter round his nostrils like a beast of burden, and was bound like a runaway with a ring in his nostrils, and his lips were pierced with an armlet. The Lord has caged him like a sparrow to be mocked by us. He and his demons have been placed like scorpions and serpents to be trodden underfoot by Christians. A proof of this is that we are now living our kind of life in spite of him. 
Behold, he who threatened to dry up the sea and seize the world now cannot hinder our practice of asceticism, nor even prevent my speaking against him. Let us then not heed what he may say, for he lies, and let us not fear his empty visions, for they also are false. That which appears in them is not true light they are bringing, but the beginning and the likeness of the fire prepared for them, and they will themselves burn in the flames by which they attempt to frighten men. They appear, of course, but they disappear again at once, hurting none of the faithful, but bearing with them the likeness of the fire that is destined to receive them. We should not, therefore, fear them on this account, for by the grace of Christ all their practices are to no purpose. But they are treacherous, and ready to change and transform themselves into every shape. Often, without appearing, they even pretend to play the harp and to sing, and they recite passages from the scriptures. Sometimes, when we are reading, they immediately repeat many times, like an echo, what we have read. When we are sleeping, they waken us to prayers, and this repeatedly, scarcely allowing us to sleep. At times, they even assume the appearance of monks, and they pretend to speak like pious men, in order to deceive by this guise, and then drag those whom they deceive wherever they will. We must not heed them, though they rouse us to prayer, though they counsel us to fast completely, though they pretend to accuse and reproach us for those things concerning which they were once in agreement with us. For they do this not for the sake of piety or of truth, but to lead the simple into despair, that they may say that asceticism is useless, and to make men disgusted with the solitary life, on the grounds that it is burdensome and very grievous, and to hinder those who live the life in spite of them. The prophets sent by the Lord declared such as these wretched, when he said, Woe to him that giveth his neighbor a turbid drink to subvert him. For such devices and thoughts turn men away from the road which leads to virtue. The Lord himself, even when the demons spoke the truth, for they spoke the truth when they said, Thou art the Son of God, silenced them, nevertheless, and forbade them to speak, lest in the midst of the truth they oversowed their own wickedness. He also wished to accustom us never to heed them, even though they seemed to speak the truth. It is unseemly that we who have the Holy Scriptures and the freedom of the Savior should be taught by the devil, who did not keep his own rank, but thinks now one thing, now another. Even when he quotes passages from the Scriptures, the Savior forbids him so speak in these words. But thus to the sinner God hath said, Why dost thou declare my justices, and take my covenant in thy mouth? For the demons do everything. They talk, they make an uproar, they dissemble, they confuse, in order to deceive the simple. They make a din, laugh senselessly, and hiss. But if no one heeds them, they afterwards weep and lament as though defeated. The Lord, then, being God, silenced the evil spirits. And it is fitting that we, learning from the saints, do as they did and imitate their courage. For when they saw these things, they used to say, When the sinner stood against me, I was dumb, and was humbled and kept silence from good things. And again, but I, as a deaf man, heard not, and as a dumb man not opening his mouth. Let us, therefore, neither listen to them, since they are hostile to us, nor heed them, even if they rouse us to prayer or speak of fastings. Let us rather attend to our own purpose of self-discipline, and let us not be deceived by those who ever act deceitfully. We must not fear them, even though they seem to attack us, even though they threaten death. They are powerless and can do nothing but threaten. Part 3 I have already spoken of these things in passing, but now we must not shrink from speaking about them at greater length. 
the warning will be a protection for you. Since the Lord dwelt among us, the enemy has fallen, and his powers have been weakened. He does not submit quietly to his fall, however, in spite of his powerlessness, but keeps threatening like a tyrant, even if only with words. Let each of you consider the following, and he can despise the evil spirits. If they were confined to bodies such as ours, they could say, When men hide themselves, we cannot find them, but if we do, we do them harm. If such were the case, we could escape them by hiding and by shutting the doors against them. But their nature is not like ours, and they can enter even when the doors are shut and take possession of all the air, they and their chief, the devil. They are bent on evil and are ready to inflict injury, for, as the Savior said, the devil, the father of evil, is a murderer from the beginning. Yet we are still alive, spending our lives in defiance of them. So it is evident that they are powerless. This place is no hindrance to their plotting, nor do they regard us friends whom they should spare. Neither are they lovers of goodness that they should amend. On the contrary, they are wicked and desire nothing so much as to injure those who love virtue and honor God. If they had the power, they would not hesitate to use it, but would do the evil at once since their purpose is toward this, and especially against us. Behold, we are now gathered together and are speaking against them, and they know that, as we advance, they grow weak. If then they had the power, they would not allow any of us Christians to live, for the service of God is an abomination to a sinner. But since they have no power, they only injure themselves, for they can do none of the things they threaten. Then this also must be considered, that we may not fear them. If they had any power, they would not come in a crowd, nor cause phantoms, nor use cunning devices by changing their appearances. It would be sufficient for only one to come and do whatever he could and wished to do, since anyone who has power does not destroy with phantoms, nor frighten with tumults, but uses his power at once as he wills. But, since the evil spirits have no power, they play as upon a stage, changing their shapes and frightening children by the apparition of crowds and by their changed forms. On this account, they are to be despised the more for their powerlessness. The true angel sent by the Lord against the Assyrians had no need of crowds nor apparitions from without, nor loud noises nor clappings, but he used his power quietly and destroyed 185,000 at one time. Powerless demons such as these, however, try to frighten, if only by empty phantoms. Should anyone ask, upon recalling the story of Job, why then did the devil go forth and do all these things against him, strip him of his possessions, destroy his children, and strike him with a grievous ulcer? Let such a one know in reply that it was not the devil who was powerful, but God who delivered Job to him to be tried. He was unable to do anything, but asked and received the power and made use of it. For this reason, the enemy is to be condemned the more, that, though he desired it, he had no power against one just man. If he had had the power, he would not have asked for it. And since he asked for it not once, but a second time, it is evident that he is weak and powerless. But it is not to be wondered that he was powerless against Job, when he could not bring destruction on even his beasts, had God not permitted. He does not have power even against swine, for, as it is written in the Gospel, they kept entreating him, saying, If thou cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. If they have no power over swine, much less have they power over men, made in the likeness of God. Therefore, we must fear God alone and despise these evil spirits, having no fear of them at all. The more they do such things, the more we should intensify our ascetical exercises against them 
for the great weapon against them is a virtuous life and confidence in God. They fear the fasting, the watching, the prayers, the meekness, and the silence of ascetics, their indifference to money and vainglory, their humility, love of the poor, their alms deeds and their gentleness, but above all, their devotion to Christ. The demons, therefore, do everything to prevent anyone tramping on them, for they know the grace the Savior has given to the faithful against them, when he said, Behold, I have given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the might of the enemy. Accordingly, if they pretend also to tell the future, pay no heed to them. Often they tell us days beforehand that brothers are coming, and then brothers do come. It is not from concern for the hearers, however, that the demons do this, but in order to gain credence for themselves, and then afterwards, when they have them in their power, to destroy them. Consequently, we must not heed them. We should refute them even as they speak, because we have no need of them. For what wonder is it if, when they have seen the brothers starting on a journey, they outrun them and announce their coming, since their bodies are more subtle than men's? A man traveling by horse would also bring word beforehand, outstripping those who travel on foot. In this case, then, there is no need to wonder at them. They knew nothing beforehand which has not already taken place. God alone knows all things before they come to pass. The demons, however, like thieves, run ahead and announce what is taking place. To how many are they now announcing our doings, that we are assembled and are speaking against them, before any one of us goes forth to announce the news? A swift-footed boy could also do this, outstripping a slower person. What I mean is this. If someone starts to travel from the Thebiad or any other place, the demons do not know whether he will travel until he actually starts. But when they have seen him setting out, they run ahead and announce it before he comes, and then after some days, he arrives. Often, however, they prove false because the travelers turn back. So, too, they sometimes idly talk about the rising waters of the river, for having observed that there have been many heavy rains in the sections of Ethiopia, and knowing that the overflow of the river originates there, they run on ahead and tell it before the water comes into Egypt. Men could tell it, too, if they could run as swiftly as the demons do, and just as David's watchmen, by going up to a high place, saw better who was coming than the one who stayed below, and also, as he who ran ahead related before the others not the things which had not yet occurred, but those which were already in progress and taking place, so too the evil spirits choose to weary themselves in making these things known to others solely to deceive them. If providence, however, should in the meantime decide otherwise concerning the waters or the travelers, for providence can do this, the evil spirits have been deceived, and those who heeded them have been tricked. It was in this way that the oracles of the Greeks originated, and in times past they were deceived by the demons. But in this way, too, their deception was latter brought to an end. For the Lord came, and he has vanquished the evil spirits with that trickery of theirs. Of themselves they have no knowledge, but... Like thieves, they pass on the things they see among others. They surmise rather than prophesy. If they sometimes chance to speak the truth, let no one wonder at them on this account. Physicians with experience of diseases often foretell the symptoms when they observe the same diseases in others, for they judge from their experience. And again, seamen and farmers, from this habit of observing the condition of the atmosphere, predict stormy or calm weather. No one could say on this account that they prophesy by divine inspiration. They speak from experience and practice. If, therefore, sometimes the evil spirits also say these things by conjecture, do not marvel at them because of it, nor heed them. What advantage is it to the hearers to learn from them days beforehand what is to happen? What sort of anxiety is this, to know such things, even if one could truly know them? 
It is not conducive to virtue, nor is it in any way a mark of good character. None of us is judged by what he does not know, and no one is accounted blessed because of his learning and knowledge. But for these things each one will be judged, if he has kept the faith and truly observed the commandments. We must not, then, attach great importance to these matters, nor live a life of self-denial and toil in order to know the future, but in order to please God by living uprightly. Neither ought we to pray to know the future, nor ask it as a reward of our austere life, but we ought to pray that the Lord may be our fellow worker in gaining victory over the devil. If we care to know the future even once, let us be pure in mind, for I believe that, when a soul is perfectly pure and has persevered in its natural state, it becomes clear-sighted and is able to see more and further than the evil spirits, since it has the Lord to reveal things to it. Therefore, whenever demons come to you by night and wish to tell the future, or say, We are angels, pay no attention to them, for they lie. And even if they praise your practice of asceticism and call you blessed, do not hearken or act as if they were there at all. Instead, bless yourselves and the house, and pray, and you will see them vanish. For they are cowards, and they greatly fear the sign of the Lord's cross, since it was on the cross that the Savior robbed them of their prey and put them to open shame. If, however, they shamelessly persist, dancing and subtly transforming themselves with their apparitions, do not shrink from them in fear, nor heed them as if they were good spirits. It is possible, with the help of God, easily to distinguish the presence of the good and the bad. A vision of the holy ones is not agitated. He shall not protest and cry out. None will hear his voice. It occurs so quietly and gently that joy and gladness and confidence are at once born in the soul. For the Lord who is our joy and the power of God the Father is with the holy ones. The soul's thoughts remain untroubled and calm, so that, enlightened of itself, it contemplates those who appear. A longing for the heavenly things to come takes possession of it, and it would wish to be wholly united to them if it could depart with them. If, however, some people, being human, are struck with fear at the vision of good angels, the visitants at once dispel this fear by their charity, as Gabriel did for Zachary, and the angel who appeared to the women at the Holy Sepulchre, and the angel that said to the shepherds in the Gospel, Fear not. Their fear is not from timidity of soul, but from the full knowledge of the presence of higher beings. Such, therefore, is the vision of holy ones. The assault and appearance of the evil ones is troubled with clamor, din, and shouting, such as the disturbance of rough youths and robbers might be. From this there follows immediately apprehension of soul, confusion and disorder of thought, dejection, hatred toward ascetics, spiritual sloth, affliction, the memory of one's family, and fear of death. Presently there is craving for evil, a contempt for virtue, and instability of character. Whenever, then, you are fearful upon seeing someone, if the fear is immediately taken from you, and in its place there comes joy inexpressible, cheerfulness, confidence, renewed strength, calmness of thought and the other signs I have named before, courage and love of God, be of good heart and pray. The joy and the settled state of the soul prove the sanctity of the one who is present. Thus Abraham rejoiced when he saw the Lord, and John leaped for joy at the voice of Mary, the mother of God. But if during an apparition there is confusion and noise from without, and earthly display and threatening of death and such things as I have mentioned before, know that it is the visitation of the evil ones. Let this likewise be a sign to you. Whenever the soul continues to be fearful, it is the enemy who is present, 
For the evil spirits do not dispel the fear of their presence, as the great archangel Gabriel did for Mary and Zachary, and as the angel who appeared to the women at the tomb. On the contrary, whenever they see men afraid, they redouble their phantoms so as to terrify them the more, that then they may come down upon them and mock them, saying, Fall down and worship us. In this manner they deceived the Greeks, for among them they were erroneously taken for gods. But the Lord has not permitted us to be deceived by the devil, because when he appeared to him, he rebuked him and said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou worship, and him only shalt thou serve. Accordingly, let us despise the crafty one more and more, for what the Lord said he said for our sake, that when the devils hear the same words from us, they may be put to flight through the Lord, who rebuked them in those words. We must not boast of casting out devils, nor be elated at the healing of diseases, nor should we admire only the man who casts out devils, and account that one useless who does not. A man should observe carefully the discipline of each monk, and either imitate it, strive to excel it, or correct it. To work miracles is not ours, that is the Savior's work. At any rate, he said to his disciples, But do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice rather in this, that your names are written in heaven. The fact that our names are written in heaven is evidence of our virtuous life, but to cast out devils is but the charismatic gift of the Savior who bestowed it. To those who boasted of their miracles and not of their virtues, saying, Lord, did we not cast out devils in thy name and work many miracles in thy name? He answered, Amen, I say to you, I know you not. For the Lord knows not the ways of the unholy. As I have said before, we ought always to pray to receive the grace of discerning spirits, in order that, as it is written, we may not trust every spirit. I would not wish to cease speaking and to say nothing about myself, content with what I have just told you, but that you may not think that I am merely talking, and may believe that I am speaking from experience and speaking the truth. I am repeating, not for myself, but for love of you and for your encouragement, what I have observed of the practices of the evil spirits, even if by doing so I make myself a fool. The Lord who hears knows this, and knows the purity of my conscience. How often have the evil spirits called me blessed, and I have cursed them in the name of the Lord. Often they have foretold the rising of the river, and I said to them, And why are you concerned about this? Once they came threatening, and surrounded me like soldiers in full armor. Sometimes they filled the house with horses and wild animals and serpents. But I sang the psalm, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will call upon the name of the Lord our God. And at these prayers they were turned back by the Lord. Once they came in the dark, assuming the appearance of light, and said, We have come to light you, Anthony. But I closed my eyes and prayed, and the light of the unholy ones was put out at once. A few months later they came as if singing psalms and babbling from the scriptures, but I, as a deaf man, heard not. Once they shook the cell, but I prayed and remained unshaken in mind. Afterwards they came again, pounding, hissing, leaping. But as I prayed and lay singing the psalms to myself, they immediately began to wail and lament as if exhausted, and I glorified the Lord who had humbled them and made an example of their blindness and fury. Once, a very tall demon appeared with a procession of evil spirits and said boldly, I am the power of God, I am his providence. What do you wish that I grant you? I then blew my breath at him, calling on the name of Christ, and I tried to strike him. I seemed to have succeeded, for immediately, vast as he was, he and all his demons disappeared at the name of Christ. 
Once, when I was fasting, the deceiver came to me as a monk with a vision of loaves and counseled me, saying, Eat and cease from your many hardships. Even you are a man and will become weak. But I perceived his artifice and rose to pray. He could not endure this, for he departed, appearing as smoke as he went out through the door. How often in the desert he showed me a vision of gold, merely to have me touch it and look at it. But I sang a psalm against him, and the illusion vanished. Frequently the demons struck me blows, but I kept saying, Nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. And at this they struck one another instead. It was not I, however, who stopped them and brought them to naught, but it was the Lord who says, I was watching Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Mindful of the apostles saying, children, I have applied the Lord's words to myself so that you may learn not to be faint-hearted in the ascetical life and not to fear the delusions of the devil and his demons. Since I have become a fool in discussing these things with you, take this also for your safety and assurance, and believe me, for I do not lie. Once, someone knocked at the door of my cell, and, going out, I saw a great towering figure. When I asked, Who are you? He said, I am Satan. Then, when I asked, Why are you here? He said, Why do the monks and all other Christians blame me without cause? Why do they curse me hourly? To my question, Why do you molest them? He answered, It is not I who molest them, but they disquiet themselves, for I am powerless. Have they not read that the swords of the enemy have lost their edge forever? Thou hast rooted up their cities. I no longer have a place, a weapon, a city. There are Christians everywhere, and now even the desert has been filled with monks. Let them watch over themselves and not curse me without cause. Then, marveling at the grace of the Lord, I answered, You always lie and never speak the truth. But this time, however, you have spoken truly even though against your will, for Christ has come and made you powerless. He has cast you down and stripped you. When he heard the Savior's name, he vanished, for he could not endure its burning heat. If, then, even the devil himself admits that he is powerless, we ought utterly to despise both him and his demons. The enemy with his hounds has but so many stratagems, and we who have learned his weakness can look upon them with contempt. Let us, therefore, not be disheartened in this matter, nor succumb to cowardice of soul, nor invent terrors for ourselves, saying, But if a demon should come and overthrow me, or lift me up and hurl me down, or come suddenly upon me and molest me. We should not even think of such things, nor should we be sad as if we were lost. We should take courage, rather, and be always joyful as men who have been saved. Let us bear in mind that the Lord who defeated and vanquished them is with us, and let us always carefully consider this fact, that, while the Lord is with us, our enemies will do nothing to us. They will conform themselves to the attitudes they find in us when they come, and thus they will adapt their phantoms to our dispositions. If they find us fearful and disquieted, they attack at once, like thieves when they find the place unguarded. And whatever we ourselves are thinking, this they carry out and more. If they see us anxious and afraid, they increase our fear the more by apparitions and threats, and our poor soul is tormented accordingly in these ways. If, however, they find us rejoicing in the Lord and meditating on the good things to come, thinking on these things of the Lord and reflecting that all things are in His hands and that no evil spirit has any strength against a Christian, 
nor any power at all over anyone. Seeing the soul safeguarded by such thoughts, they turn away in confusion. Thus, when the enemy saw Job fenced about with these thoughts, he withdrew from him. But, finding Judas undefended, he captured him. If, then, we would despise the enemy, we must keep our thoughts always on the things of the Lord and let our soul ever rejoice in hope. We shall see that the artifices of the demons are as smoke and that instead of pursuing, they themselves are put to flight, for they are, as I have said before, very cowardly and are always expecting the fire which is prepared for them. Keep this also as a sign for your protection against them. Whenever an apparition occurs, do not be overcome with fear at the outset. But, whatever it be, first boldly ask, Who are you and why are you here? If it is a vision of angels or of saints, they will reassure you and turn your fear into joy. But if it is anything diabolical, it immediately loses all strength on seeing your resolute spirit, for simply to ask, Who are you and why are you here? is proof of calmness. Thus, when the son of Nun inquired, he received an answer, and the enemy did not escape when Daniel questioned him. While Anthony spoke of these things, all were filled with joy. In some, the love of virtue increased. In others, carelessness was overcome, and in others, self-conceit was curbed. All were persuaded to despise the snares of the devil, and everyone marveled at the grace which the Lord had given to Anthony for the discerning of spirits. So the cells in the hills were like tabernacles, filled with heavenly choirs singing psalms, studying, fasting, praying, rejoicing in the hope of things to come, laboring in order to give alms with love and harmony one toward another. And truly, one could see a land set apart, as it were, a land of piety and justice, for neither wrongdoer nor wronged was there, nor complaint of the tax collector, but a great number of ascetics, all of one mind toward virtue. As one looked again on the cells and on the regularity of the monks, one cried aloud, saying, How beautiful are thy tabernacles, O Jacob! Thy tents, O Israel, as woody valleys, as watered gardens near the rivers, as tabernacles which the Lord hath pitched, as cedars by the waterside. Part 4 Anthony returned alone to his own cell, as usual, and intensified his spiritual life. Often each day he sighed at the thought of the mansions of heaven, as he longed for them and reflected on the shortness of man's life. He was filled with shame when going to eat and sleep, and when caring for the other needs of the body, as he thought of the spirituality of the soul. Frequently, when he was to eat with many other monks, when he recalled the food of the spirit, he excused himself and went at a distance from them, thinking it cause for shame that he should be seen eating by others. He used to eat when alone, however, because of bodily necessity, and often too with the brethren, and, though ashamed on their account, he spoke freely because of the words of help he gave them. He used to say that we should give all our time to the soul rather than to the body, but that we ought to allow a little time to the body. In general, however, we should rather devote our time to the soul and seek its profit, so that it may not be dragged down by the pleasures of the body, but that the body may be made subject to the soul instead, for this is what the Savior said. Do not fret over your life, how to support it with food, over your body, how to keep it clothed. Do not seek what you shall eat or what you shall drink, and do not exalt yourselves, for after all these things the nations of the world seek but your Father knows that you need these things. 
Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be given you besides. After this, the persecution which then occurred under Maximinus laid hold upon the church. When the holy martyrs were led to Alexandria, Anthony quit his cell and followed them, saying, Let us also go, that we may enter into the contest if we are called, or else that we may look on those who are contending. He longed for martyrdom, but as he did not wish to give himself up, he ministered to the confessors in the mines and in the prisons. In the court of justice, he was very zealous in stirring to generosity in their struggles those who were summoned, and in receiving those who were to undergo martyrdom and accompanying them to the end. The judge, seeing the fearlessness of Anthony and his companions, and their zeal in this work, gave orders that no monk should appear in the court, nor even remain in the city. All the others thought it well to hide themselves that day. But Anthony heeded the command to this extent, that he washed his tunic the more, and on the following day stood on a high place out in front, where he was in plain view of the prefect. Then, while all wondered at this, and the prefect saw him as he went through with his escort, Anthony stood there calmly, showing the eagerness that we Christians have. He was praying that he too might be martyred, as I have said before, and he grieved because he had not yet been called to be a martyr. But the Lord was keeping him to help us and others, that he might teach many the practice of asceticism that he had himself learned from the Scriptures. Many, on merely seeing his manner of acting, were eager to imitate his mode of life, He again ministered to the confessors as before, wearying himself in serving them as if he were a prisoner with them. When at length the persecution had ceased and the blessed Bishop Peter had died a martyr, Anthony departed and again retired to the cell. There he was daily a martyr to conscience in the sufferings he endured for the faith. He practiced a much more intense asceticism, for he fasted constantly and wore a garment made of skin, the inner lining of which was of hair. He kept this even until his death. He never bathed his body with water to cleanse it, nor did he even wash his feet. He would not allow them to put in water at all without necessity. No one ever saw him unclothed, nor did anyone, except when he died and was buried, see Anthony's body uncovered. After he had withdrawn, and had resolved to spend a fixed time during which he himself would neither go outside nor receive anyone, Martinianus, a captain of the soldiers, came and disturbed him, for he had a daughter troubled by an evil spirit. The captain stayed a long time, knocking at the door, asking him to come and pray to God for the child. But Anthony did not allow the door to be opened. Leaning out from above, he said, Man, Why do you keep crying out to me? I am only a man like yourself. If you believe in Christ whom I serve, go, and according as you believe, pray to God and it will be done. Immediately, therefore, believing and calling upon Christ, Martinianus went away with his daughter made clean from the evil spirit. The Lord effected many other things also through Anthony, for he said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Many of the sufferers simply slept outside his cell since he did not open the door, and they were cleansed because they believed and prayed sincerely. As he saw that many crowded to him, and that he was not permitted to withdraw according to his resolution as he wished, fearing that either he would become proud because of the things the Lord was accomplishing through him, or that someone would think more highly of him than the truth warranted, after considering the matter, he set out for the upper Thebiad among those who did not know him. He had even gotten the loaves from the brethren and was sitting on the bank of the river watching for a boat to pass so that he might board it and go with them. While he was thinking of this, a voice came to him from above. Anthony, where are you going and why? He was not frightened, for he was accustomed to be called in this way frequently. So he listened and answered, The crowds do not allow me to be alone. I therefore wish to go into the upper Thebiad, because there are many annoyances for me here, but chiefly because people ask me things beyond my power. And the voice said to him, Even though you go up into the Thebiad, or down into the pasture lands as you are planning, 
you will have to endure a doubly great burden. If, however, you wish to be really alone, go up now into the inner desert. And who will show me the way? Anthony asked, for I do not know it. Immediately he was shown some Saracens starting out in that direction. He went forward to meet them, and when he asked to go with them into the desert, they welcomed him gladly, as if by the command of Providence. He traveled with them three days and three nights, until he came to a very high hill, at the foot of which there was water very clear and sweet and very cold. Beyond there was level ground and a few wild date palms. Anthony, moved by God as it were, was delighted with the place, for it was this spot which the voice had spoken of when he was on the river bank. After he had received bread from his fellow travelers to start with, he remained alone on the hill, with no one else with him. For from then on he kept that place as one who had discovered his own home. The Saracens, having seen Anthony's earnestness, used to travel that way purposely, and were glad to bring him bread, and sometimes he had also a little frugal refreshment from the date palms. Later, when the brethren learned the place, like children mindful of their father, they were careful to send him bread. But, when Anthony saw that because of the bread some were being put to trouble and hardship, he decided to ask some of those who came to him to bring him a two-pronged hoe, an axe, and a little grain. When they brought these things, he went over the ground round the hill and found a small plot that was suitable, which he tilled and sowed, for he had water in abundance from the spring. He did this every year and had bread as a result, rejoicing that he would trouble no one on this account and that he was keeping himself from being a burden in any way. Later, when he saw that people were coming to him again, he raised a few vegetables also, that the visitors might have some little refreshment after the weariness of that hard journey. At first, however, the beasts in the desert often used to damage his crop and his garden when they came for water. But, having caught one of them, he said graciously to all, Why do you harm me when I do you no harm? Go away, and in the name of the Lord, do not come near these things any more. After that, as if fearing his command, they no longer came near the place. He was then alone on the inner mountain, devoting himself to his prayers and spiritual exercises. The brethren who served him, however, asked that they might come each month to bring him olives, pulse, and oil, for he was now an old man. The many wrestlings he endured while he dwelt there, we have learned from those who visited him. Wrestlings not against flesh and blood, as it is written, but against opposing demons, for there also the brethren heard the tumults and the sound of many voices and the clash of weapons, as it were. And at night they saw that hill filled with wild beasts, and they saw him fighting as with invisible foes and praying against them. He comforted his visitors, but he himself fought as he knelt and prayed to the Lord. It was indeed remarkable that, though alone in such a wilderness, he was not frightened away by the demons who attacked him, nor alarmed at the wildness of the four-footed beasts and creeping things, although they were numerous. But he truly trusted the Lord like Mount Zion, as the scripture says, with a serene and tranquil mind, so that the demons fled instead, and the wild beasts kept peace with him, as it is written. The devil, therefore, watched Anthony and gnashed his teeth against him, as David sings in the psalm, but Anthony was consoled by the Savior and remained unharmed by the devil's wickedness and his many arts. The devil, therefore, watched Anthony and gnashed his teeth against him, as David sings in the psalm. But Anthony was consoled by the Savior and remained unharmed by the devil's wickedness and his many arts. The devil set wild beasts on him as he watched at night, and nearly all the hyenas in that desert came out from their dens and surrounded him. He was in their midst, and each with open mouth threatening to bite him. But he was aware of the enemy's craft, and said to all of them, If you have received power over me, I am ready to be devoured by you. But if you are sent by evil spirits, go without delay, for I am a servant of Christ. 
They fled when Anthony said this, as if driven by the whip of his words. A few days later, as he was busy at his work, for he was careful to work hard, someone stood at the door and pulled the plate he was making, for he was weaving baskets which he gave to visitors in exchange for what they brought. He rose and saw a beast resembling a man as far as the thighs, but with legs and feet like an ass. Anthony simply blessed himself and said, I am a servant of Christ. If you have been sent against me, here I am. The beast with its evil spirits fled so fast that in its speed it fell and died. The death of the beast marked the defeat of the demons, for they were doing everything in their power to drive him from the desert, but they could not. Once, because he had been asked by the monks to return after a time and visit them in their places, he set out with the monks who had come to meet him. A camel carried the loaves and the water for them, since the entire desert is without water. There is none at all to drink, except on that one mountain where Anthony had his cell, and it was from there that they had drawn the water. When, therefore, the water failed on the way, and the heat was intense, they were all in danger. After searching around and finding no water, they were no longer able to walk. So they laid down on the ground. They let the camel go, for they despaired of themselves. The old man, seeing all in danger, was much grieved. With a groan he went a little distance from them, and knelt and prayed with extended arms. At once the Lord caused a spring to come forth where he had stopped to pray and all drank and were refreshed. After filling their water skins, they searched for the camel and found it. The rope had chanced to encircle a stone, and in this way was held fast. When they had brought the animal back and watered it, they placed the skins on it and went on their way unharmed. When Anthony came to the outer monasteries, all the monks embraced him, for they looked on him as a father, and he, as though bringing supplies from his hill, refreshed and aided them with his words. There then was joy in the hills again, and eagerness to advance, and encouragement because of their mutual faith. He too rejoiced when he saw the zeal of the monks, and learned that his sister had grown old in her virginity and was guiding other virgins. After some days, Anthony went back to the mountain, from that time on, many people came to him, and even some who were sufferers ventured to come. For all the monks who came to him, he always had this advice, to trust in the Lord and to love him, to guard themselves from impure thoughts and the pleasures of the flesh, and, as is written in Proverbs, not to be led astray by feasting of the stomach, to flee vain glory, to pray always, to sing psalms before sleep, and, on awakening, to repeat by heart the commandments in the scriptures, and to remember the deeds of the saints, so that the soul, conforming itself to their precepts, might train itself to imitate their zeal. He counseled them especially to heed constantly the apostle's word, Do not let the sun go down upon your anger, and to consider that this was spoken about all the commandments alike. The sun should not go down, not simply on our anger, but on any other of our sins, for it is right and necessary that the sun should not condemn us for any evil by day, nor the moon for any sin, not even an evil thought, by night. To preserve this disposition, he said, it is well to hear and heed the apostle, for he says, Put your own selves to test and prove yourselves. Daily, therefore, let each one take account with himself of the actions of the day and the night, if he has sinned, let him cease, and if he has not, let him not boast, but persevere in good, without growing negligent, nor condemning his neighbor, nor justifying himself, till the Lord come who searches hidden things, as the blessed Apostle Paul said. Often we are unaware of what we do, and we do not know, but the Lord sees everything. In trusting judgment to him, then, let us sympathize with one another bearing one another's burdens. But let us judge ourselves and be earnest in filling up the things in which we are lacking. 
As a safeguard against sin, let the following be observed. Let us note and write down our deeds and the movements of our soul, as if we were to tell them to each other. If we are utterly ashamed to have them known, be assured that we shall cease sinning and even cease thinking anything evil. Who wishes to be seen sinning, or, when he has sinned, does not pretend otherwise because he wishes to escape notice? Therefore, just as we would not commit fornication in the sight of each other, so if we write our thoughts as if to tell them to one another, we shall guard ourselves the better from foul thoughts through shame of having them known. Let the written account serve us instead of the eyes of our fellow monks, so that, blushing at the writing as at being seen, we may not even think an evil thought, and molding ourselves in this way, we shall be able to bring the body into subjection to please God and to trample on the snares of the enemy. Such were the counsels Anthony gave to those who came to him. He sympathized and prayed with those who were suffering, and the Lord often heard him, as he showed in many ways. When he was heard, he did not boast, nor did he murmur when not heard, but he always gave thanks to the Lord and encouraged the sufferers to be patient and to know that healing belonged neither to him nor to any man, but to God alone, who works when he wills and toward whom he wills. The sufferers, therefore, received even the words of the old man as healing, having learned not to be downcast, but rather to suffer in patience. And those who were cured learned not to thank Anthony, but God alone. Part 5 A man named Fronto from the court had a terrible disease, for he kept biting his tongue and was in danger of injuring his eyes. He came to the mountain and asked Anthony to pray for him. After he had prayed, Anthony said to Fronto, Go now, and you shall be healed. Fronto objected and remained in the house for days, but Anthony kept saying, You cannot be healed while you remain here. Go away and when you reach Egypt, you will see the sign which is being done in you. The man believed and went away, and, when he had only come within sight of Egypt, he was cured of his disease and made well, according to the work of Anthony, which he had learned from the Savior in prayer. A young girl from Busiris in Tripoli had a dreadfully offensive disease. The discharge from her eyes, nose, and ears fell to the ground and immediately turned to worms, and her body was paralyzed, and her eyes were crossed. Her parents, hearing of the monks who were going to Anthony, asked to journey with them with their daughter, for they had faith in the Lord who had healed the woman troubled with an issue of blood. And when the monks consented, the parents and the child remained beyond the mountain with Paphnutius, the confessor and monk, while the others went in. When they wanted merely to tell about the girl, Anthony interrupted them and described the child's disease and how she had traveled with them. When they asked that she and her parents also be admitted to come to him, he would not allow it, but said, Go, and if she is not dead, you will find her cured. For this is not my doing that she should come to me, a wretched man. Healing is from the Savior, who shows his mercy in every place to those who call upon him. To her prayers, therefore, the Lord has been gracious, and his love has revealed to me that he will heal the child's sickness while she is there. The miracle then took place, for they went out and found the parents rejoicing, and the girl now in sound health. Two of the brethren were coming to him when, on the way, the water failed. One died, and the other was on the point of dying. He no longer had strength to go on and lay on the ground awaiting death. But Anthony, sitting on the mountain, called two monks who happened to be there and said urgently to them, Take a jar of water and run down the road toward Egypt. Two monks were on their way, but one has just died. The other also will die if you do not hasten. This has just been shown to me as I prayed. The monks went, therefore, and found one monk lying dead, and they buried him. 
They revived the other with water and brought him to the old man, for the distance was a day's journey. If anyone asks why Anthony did not speak before the other died, such a question is amiss, for the sentence of death was not from Anthony, but from God, who decreed death for the one and revealed the dangerous state of the other. In Anthony this only is wonderful, that, while sitting on the mountain, he kept his heart recollected, and the Lord revealed to him things taking place at a distance. On another occasion also, as he was sitting on the mountain, he looked up and saw one being borne along in the air, and there was great rejoicing among all who met him. Wondering then, and thinking such a company blessed, he prayed to learn what it might be. Immediately a voice came to him that this was the soul of the monk Amun in Nitria, who had persevered as an ascetic until old age. Now, the distance from Nitria to the mountain where Anthony was is thirteen days' journey. Those who were with Anthony, therefore, seeing the old man in wonder, asked to know why, and heard that Amun had just died. He was well known, because he often came there, and also because many miracles had been worked through him. Once, when Amun had to cross the river called Lycus, when the waters were at flood tide, he asked his companion Theodore to keep at a distance from his so that they might not see each other naked as they swam across the river. Theodore then went away, but Amun was again ashamed even to see himself unclothed. While he was pondering, therefore, filled with shame, he was suddenly carried over to the other side. Theodore, himself a devout man, came near, and seeing that Amun, who had gotten the start of him, was not even wet from the water, asked to know how he had crossed. When he saw that Amun was reluctant to say, he seized his feet and declared that he would not let go of them until he had learned this from him. Amun, seeing Theodore's determination, especially from his speech, asked him in turn not to tell anyone until his death, and then told him that he had been carried across and set down on the other side, that he had not walked on the water, for this was altogether impossible to men, and possible only to the Lord and to those to whom he granted it, as he did to the great apostle Peter. Theodore told this incident after Amun's death. The monks to whom Anthony spoke of Amun's death noted the day, and when, thirty days later, the brethren came from Nitria, they inquired and learned from them that Amun had fallen asleep on the day and hour when the old man had seen his soul carried upward. Both they themselves and the others wondered at the purity of Anthony's soul, that he should learn at once what had happened at a distance of thirteen days' journey, and should see the soul being led heavenward. Count Archelaus once met Anthony on the outer mountain, asked him merely to pray for Polycrates, an admirable and Christ-like virgin of Laodicea. She was suffering terribly in the stomach and side from her excessive penances, and her whole body was weak. Anthony prayed, therefore, and the Count noted the day the prayer was made. When he returned to Laodicea, he found the virgin well, so he asked when and on what day she was relieved of her sickness, and brought out the paper on which he had noted the time of the prayer. Upon learning the time, he at once showed the writing on the paper, and all wondered, for they recognized that the Lord had freed her from her pains while Anthony was praying for her and invoking the goodness of the Savior in her behalf. Anthony often told days beforehand, sometimes even a month, those who were coming to him and the reason for their coming. Some came simply to see him, some because of sickness, and others because they were suffering from devils. No one thought the weariness of the journey either a trouble or a loss, for each one returned conscious that he had been helped. Although Anthony foretold such things and foresaw them happening, he used to ask that no one should admire him on this account, but rather marvel at the Lord, who has granted us the grace to know him according to our capacity. On another occasion, he again went down to the outer monasteries, where he was asked to enter a boat and pray with the monks. He alone perceived a foul and terribly acrid odor. The men on the boat said that the fish and pickled meat in the vessel were causing the odor, but Anthony said that the foul odor was due to something else. Even as he was speaking, a young man with an evil spirit suddenly cried out. He had come on earlier and was hiding in the boat. When rebuked in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the evil spirit went out of the man and he was made whole. 
and everyone knew that the evil spirit had caused the foul odor. Another man, one of the nobles who had a devil, came to him. This devil was so terrible that the possessed man did not know that he was coming to Anthony. He even used to eat the excrement from his own body. Those who brought him begged Anthony to pray for him, and Anthony, in pity, prayed and watched with the young man during the whole night. Toward dawn, the youth came and suddenly attacked Anthony and gave him a push. His companions were indignant, but Anthony said, Do not be angry with him, for it is not he, but the devil who is in him. The devil has done this in his fury at being rebuked and commanded to go into waterless places. Give glory to God, therefore. His attacking me in this way is a sign to you that the devil has departed. At Anthony's words, the young man was immediately made whole, and then, having recovered his right mind, he realized where he was and embraced the old man as he gave thanks to God. A number of the monks have related, and their stories agree, many other things similar to this that Anthony did. Yet these are not so marvelous as other even greater wonders seem to be. Once, about the ninth hour, when he had stood up to pray before eating, he felt himself carried away in spirit, and, incredible as it may seem, as he stood he saw himself from outside himself, as it were, being guided through the air by certain beings. Then he saw malign and terrifying beings stationed in the air who were endeavoring to hinder his passage. When his guides resisted them, they demanded an accounting to determine whether or not he was answerable to them. When, however, they wished to take an account from his birth, Anthony's guides prevented them, saying, The Lord has wiped out his faults from the time of his birth, but you may take an account from the time he became a monk and promised himself to God. Then, after they accused him but proved nothing, his way became free and unhindered, and immediately he saw himself coming, as it were, and re-entering himself, and again he was Anthony as before. He forgot to eat and remained the rest of the day and all of the night groaning and praying, for he was astonished to see against how many enemies we wrestle and with what great difficulties we have to pass through the air. He remembered that the apostle had meant this when he said, According to the prince of the power of the air about us. For here the enemy has power to fight and to try to hinder those who pass through. For this reason, Anthony exhorted particularly, Take up the armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, so that anyone opposing may be put to shame, having nothing bad to say of us. Having learned this, let us remember the Apostle's word, Whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows. But Paul was caught up into the third heaven and heard inexpressible words and returned, whereas Anthony saw himself entering the air and struggling until he was proved free. He had this grace also from God. If ever he was perplexed about anything, when he searched within himself as he sat alone on the mountain, the solution was revealed to him by providence in prayer. He was one of the blessed who are taught of God, as it is written. Afterwards, he discussed with some of those who came to him the life of the soul and the nature of the place it will have hereafter. And on the following night, someone from above called him, saying, Anthony, arise, go out and look. He went out, therefore, for he knew which voice to obey, and, looking up, he saw a towering figure standing formless and terrifying, reaching to the clouds, and he saw people going upward, as if on wings. The figure was stretching out its hands, and it stopped some, but others, by flying above it, passed over it and rose without further trouble. The towering figure then gnashed its teeth at these, but exulted over those who fell. Then a voice came to Anthony, Understand the vision. And his mind was opened, and he understood that it was the passing souls, and that the towering figure was the power, and prevents them from passing. But he is unable to seize those who have not yet yielded to him, as they pass above him.
After this vision, which he took as another reminder, as it were, Anthony strove the more to advance day by day. He was reluctant to relate these things to others, and continued long in prayer, wondering at them within himself. When his companions pressed him with their questions, however, he was compelled to speak, as a father who cannot withhold things from his children. He thought that, since his own conscience was blameless, the telling would help them, for they would learn that the ascetical life bears good fruit, and that visions frequently are a solace for its hardships. Anthony was of a patient disposition and humble of heart. Great as he was, he reverenced the law of the church to an extraordinary degree, and wished every cleric to be shown more honor than himself. He was not ashamed to bow his head to bishops and priests, and, whenever a deacon came to him for help, he discussed what was necessary to help him, but gave place to him in the matter of prayer, for he himself was not ashamed to learn. Often he would ask questions and beg to hear from his companions, and, if someone said anything useful, he acknowledged that he was helped by it. His countenance was extraordinarily beautiful. This was likewise a gift from the Savior, for even if he was with the company of monks and someone who had not known him before wished to see him, immediately upon coming up to them he would pass the others by and run straight to Anthony, as if drawn by his eyes. Not that he was taller or of larger build than the others, it was the serenity of his disposition and the purity of his soul that were extraordinary. His soul was tranquil, hence his exterior senses were untroubled, and his face radiated the inner joy of his soul. One realized the state of his soul from the movements of his body, according to the scripture. A glad heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by grief of mind the spirit is cast down. Thus Jacob knew that Laban was devising a plot, and said to his wives, your father's countenance is not as yesterday and the day before. Thus also Samuel recognized David, for he had joyous eyes and teeth as white as milk. Thus also was Anthony recognized, for he was never troubled, because his soul was calm and never gloomy, because he had a joyful heart. Anthony's devotion to the faith was most extraordinary. He never held communion with the Miletian schismatics because he knew their wicked apostasy from the beginning. Nor did he have friendly dealings with the Manichaeans or any other heretics, except in so far as to admonish them to be converted to piety, for he believed and maintained that friendship and association with them was harmful and destructive to the soul. He likewise detested the heresy of the Arians and charged everyone not to go near them and not to hold their false belief. On one occasion, when some of the Ariamanites came to him, after he questioned them and learned that they were wanting in piety, he drove them from the mountain, for he said that their words were worse than the poison of serpents. Once also he was filled with indignation and wrath against the Arians, when they falsely asserted that he was of the same mind as they. Then, at the request of the bishops and all the brethren, he came down from the mountain and went into Alexandria where he publicly denounced the Arians, declaring that this was the last heresy, the forerunner of Antichrist. And he taught the people that the Son of God is not a creature, and that he is not begotten from nothingness, but that he is the eternal word and wisdom of the substance of the Father. It is impious, therefore, to say that there was a time when he was not, for the word was always coexisting with the Father. Have no fellowship then with these impious Arians, he said, for there is no fellowship between light and darkness. You are devout Christians, but they, when they say that the Son and Word of God the Father is a creature, differ in no way from the pagans who worship the creature instead of God the Creator. You may be sure that the whole of creation is angry with them, because they count among creatures the Creator and Lord of all, by whom all things were made. The people all rejoiced when they heard so great a man anathematize the heresy which was making war against Christ, and all the townspeople hurried out to see Anthony. The Greeks and their so-called priests also came into the church, saying, We beg to see the man of God, for everyone called him this. Here, too, the Lord cleansed many from devils through him and healed those whose minds were affected. Many of the Greeks asked only to touch the old man, 
believing they would be helped. In those few days, doubtless, as many became Christians as one would otherwise have seen converted in a year. Some thought that he was annoyed by the crowds, and they were keeping the people away from him. But he was not at all disturbed, and said, These people are no more numerous than the evil spirits with whom we wrestle on the mountain. When he was leaving, and we were seeing him on his way, a woman behind us cried out as we came to the gate, Wait, man of God, my daughter is grievously troubled by a devil. Wait, I beseech you, lest I injure myself by running. The old man heard, and, at our request, waited willingly. When the woman drew near, the child was hurled to the ground, but, after Anthony prayed and spoke the name of Christ, the child rose up healed, for the unclean spirit had gone out of her. The mother blessed God, and everyone gave thanks, and Anthony too rejoiced as he set out for the mountain as for his own home. Anthony was unusually prudent. The extraordinary thing was that, although he had no education, he was a discerning and intelligent man. At any rate, two Greek philosophers once came to him, thinking they would try their skill on him. He was on the outer mountain, and, having recognized the men from their appearance, he went out to them and, by means of an interpreter, asked, Why have you philosophers put yourselves to so much trouble to come to a foolish man? And when they answered that he was not a foolish man, but a very wise one, he replied, If you have come to a fool, your labor is useless. But if you think me wise, become what I am, for we ought to imitate the good. Had I gone to you, I should have imitated you. But since you have come to me, become what I am, for I am a Christian. They went away wondering, for they saw that even the devils feared Anthony. Certain others, and they too were philosophers, met him on the outer mountain, intending to mock him because he had no schooling. Anthony said to them, What do you say? Which is first, the mind or letters? And which is the cause of which? the mind of letters, or letters of the mind. And when they answered that the mind is first, and that it is the inventor of letters, Anthony said, Then one who has a sound mind has no need of letters. This astounded both the philosophers and the bystanders, and they went away marveling that they had seen such intelligence in an unlettered man. For he did not have the rough manners of one who had been reared on the mountain and who had grown old there but he was both gracious and courteous. His speech was seasoned with the divine salt. Hence, no one bore him any ill will. On the contrary, all who went to see him were delighted with him. Afterwards, of course, some others came, and they were of those who were considered learned by the Greeks. They asked him for an explanation of our belief in Christ, and attempted to argue about the preaching of the Holy Cross with the intention of scoffing at it. Anthony waited a little, and, having first deplored their ignorance, said to them through an interpreter, Which is nobler, to confess the cross, or to attribute adultery and pederasty to those whom you call gods? Our choice is proof of manliness, a token of our contempt of death, but yours is the passion of lust. Then, is it better to say that the word of God was not changed, but remaining the same, took a human body to save and help men, so that having shared our human birth, he might make men partakers of the divine and spiritual nature, or to liken the divine to senseless things, and then to worship four-footed creatures, serpents, and the images of men. For these are the things you wise men worship. How do you dare scoff at us for saying that Christ has appeared as man, when you, drawing the soul down from heaven, maintain that it has strayed and fallen from heaven's vault into the body, and would that it were only into a human body, and that it did not pass on and change into four-footed creatures and serpents. Our faith teaches that Christ came for the salvation of men, but you err because you declare that the soul is ingenerate. We believe in the power of providence and his love for men, and we hold that Christ's coming in the flesh is not impossible with God, but you, maintaining that the soul is an image of the mind, ascribe falls to it and in your myths represent it as changeable, 
And now you are asserting that the mind itself is changeable by reason of the soul. For whatever the nature of the image, such must be the nature of that of which it is the image. When you hold such views about the mind, consider well that you are blaspheming also the father of the mind. As for the cross, which would you say is better? To submit to the cross without shrinking from any kind of death whatsoever when wicked men are plotting against you? Or to relate mythical tales of the wanderings of Osiris and Isis, and the plots of Typhon, and the flight of Cronus, and the devouring of his children, and the slaying of fathers? For this is what your wisdom consists of. If you mock the cross, why do you not marvel at the resurrection? Those who tell of the one wrote of the other also. Or why, when you mention the cross, are you silent concerning the dead who were raised to life, the blind who regained their sight, the paralytics who were cured, the lepers who were cleansed, the walking on the sea and the other signs and wonders which prove Christ is not merely man, but God? You seem to me to be doing yourselves a grave injustice, and you seem not to have really read our scriptures. Read them, and see that the things Christ did prove him to be God who dwells among us for the salvation of mankind. But tell us of your own teachings. Yet what more could you say about senseless creatures than that they are senseless and gross? But if, as I hear, you wish to say that these things are told among you as myths, that you make the rape of Persephone an allegory of the earth, and Hephaestus's lameness an allegory of fire, and Hera of the air, Apollo of the sun, Artemis of the moon, and Poseidon of the sea, you are nevertheless not worshipping God. You are serving the creature instead of the God who created all things. If you have devised such tales because of the beauty of creation, it was fitting that you stop short at admiration and not make gods of creatures by offering them the honor due their creator. If such be the case, it is time that you pay the honor due the architect to the house he has built, or that due the general to the soldier. What then do you say to these things, that we may determine whether there is anything about the cross that deserves mockery? The learned ones were at a loss, and kept turning this way and that. So Anthony smiled, and again spoke through an interpreter. A mere glance proves that these things are false. But since you rely on logical reasoning, for this is your special art, and since you wish that we should not even worship God without convincing arguments, tell me first how things, but especially the knowledge of God, are accurately known, through logical demonstrations or through the operation of faith. And which is higher, an active faith or a logical demonstration? When they answered that an active faith is higher and is accurate knowledge, Anthony said, You are correct, for faith comes from the disposition of the soul, but dialectic is from the skill of those who devised it. Therefore, to those who have an active faith, proof by reasoning is unnecessary and probably useless. For you are trying to establish by arguments what we know by faith, and often you cannot even express what we know. The operation of faith is, then, better and surer than your sophistical deductions. Furthermore, we Christians do not hold the mystery in the wisdom of Greek reasonings, but in the power of faith abundantly given to us by God through Jesus Christ, in proof of this claim, see that we, without having learned letters, believe in God, knowing from His works His providence over all things. To show that our faith is an active faith, see now that we rely on our faith in Christ, whereas you rely on sophistical disputations. Yet the portents of the idols are disappearing among you, whereas among us the faith is spreading everywhere and you with your syllogisms and sophistries make no converts from Christianity to Hellenism. But we, teaching faith in Christ, expose your superstitions, for all are recognizing that Christ is God and the Son of God. With all your eloquence of language, you do not hinder the teaching of Christ, while we, by invoking Christ crucified, drive away all the demons whom you fear as gods. Where the sign of the cross is made, Magic loses its power and sorcery fails. Tell me, therefore, 
Where now are your oracles? Where are the incantations of the Egyptians? Where are the delusions of the magicians? When did all these lose their power and cease, but at the coming of the cross of Christ? Is it the cross, then, that is deserving of scorn, and not rather the things which it has made void and proved worthless? This also is cause for wonder, that your teaching was never persecuted, but was even honored by men throughout the country, while the followers of Christ are persecuted. Yet it is our teaching, not yours, that is flourishing and spreading. Your teachings perish in spite of praise and honor. Faith in the teaching of Christ, however, has filled the world, notwithstanding your mockery or the frequent persecution of rulers. For when did the knowledge of God so shine forth? When did chastity and the virtue of virginity so manifest itself? Or when was death so despised as since the cross of Christ appeared? No one doubts this who sees the martyrs scorning death for the sake of Christ, or beholds the virgins of the church who keep their bodies pure and undefiled for his sake. These proofs are sufficient to show that faith in Christ is the only true worship. Even now, you who seek conclusions based on arguments are without faith. But, not in the persuasive words of Greek wisdom, as our teacher said, do we set forth arguments. We win men by faith, which plainly anticipates the process of arguments. See, there are here present some who are suffering from evil spirits. They were persons who had come to him because they were troubled by demons. He brought them into the midst and said, Either cleanse them by syllogisms and by any art or magic you wish, while you call upon your idols, or, if you cannot, cease your contention with us, and you shall see the power of the cross of Christ. At these words, he invoked Christ and made the sign of the cross over the sufferers two or three times. Immediately the men stood up, now perfectly sound in mind, blessing the Lord. The so-called philosophers were astonished and genuinely amazed at the wisdom of the man and at the miracle which had been worked. Anthony said, Why do you wonder at this? It is not we who do it, but Christ who works these things through those who believe in him. Do you also believe, therefore, and you shall see that what we have is not a trick of words, but faith which works through love for Christ. If you obtain it, you will no longer seek proofs by arguments. You will account faith in Christ sufficient. These were Anthony's words, and they marveled at them, and, after embracing him and acknowledging the help they had received from him, they went away. Part 6 Anthony's fame reached even the emperors, for when Constantine Augustus and his sons, Constantius and Constans, the Augusti, learned these things, they wrote to him as to a father and begged an answer from him. He, however, considered the documents of no great importance and was not elated over the letters. He remained just as he had been before the emperors wrote to him. When the letters were brought to him, he summoned the monks and said, do not be astonished if an emperor writes to us, for he is a man. Wonder, rather, that God has written the law for men and has spoken to us through his own Son. He did not wish to accept the letters, pleading that he did not know how to answer them, but when the monks urged that the emperors were Christians, he permitted the letters to be read, lest they should take offense on the ground that he had willfully disregarded them. He wrote an answer expressing approval of the emperors because they worshipped Christ, and advising them in the interests of their salvation not to think much of things present, but to remember the judgment to come, and to know that Christ alone is the true and everlasting King. He begged them to be lovers of their fellow men, to show concern for justice, and to care for the poor. They were glad to receive his letter. Thus everyone loved him, and all sought to have him 
as a father. Although he was recognized as such a great man and gave such wise answers to those who came to him, he returned once more to the inner mountain and went on with his customary exercises. Frequently, when sitting or walking with those who came to him, he held his peace, as it is written in Daniel, and after a time he would resume his conversation with the brethren. His companions realized that he was seeing some vision. For often on the mountain he saw what was happening in Egypt and described it to Serapion the bishop, who was within and saw Anthony held by the vision. Once, as he sat working, he fell into an ecstasy, as it were, during which he kept sighing deeply. After a while, he turned to his companions with a deep groan and, trembling, fell on his knees to pray, where he remained a long time. When the old man arose, he was weeping. His companions, trembling and fearful, then asked to be told what he had seen and gave him no peace until they compelled him to speak. Then, with a loud groan, he said, My children, it is better to die before what I have seen in this vision takes place. And when they questioned him further, he said as he wept, Wrath is to fall upon the church, and she will be delivered up to men who are like senseless beasts. I saw the table of the Lord, and mules standing around it on all sides in a circle and kicking what was within, as beasts kick when they leap in wild confusion. Surely you heard how I kept sighing, for I heard a voice saying, My altar shall be made an abomination. This was what the old man saw, and two years later the present onset of the Arians occurred. They plundered churches, and, after seizing the vessels, not only had the pagans carry them away, but even forced pagans from the workshops to attend their meetings, and in their meetings, and in their presence, did what they wished upon the sacred table. Then we all understood that the kicking of the mules had signified to Anthony beforehand what the Arians, like brute beasts, are now doing. After this vision, he comforted his companions, saying, Do not lose heart, children, for as the Lord has been angry, so will he heal again, and the church shall quickly recover her own good order and shall shine as she has shown. You will see the persecuted restored and impiety retreating into its own hiding places and the true faith everywhere speaking openly with all freedom. Only do not defile yourselves with the Arians, for their teaching is not of the apostles, but of the demons and their father the devil. Indeed, it is the barren and senseless product of a distorted mind resembling the senselessness of the mules. Such were the powers of Anthony. We must not doubt that these many wonders were performed by a man, for it is the promise of the Savior who said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Remove from here, and it will remove, and nothing will be impossible to you. And again, Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive and it is he who said to his disciples and to all who believe in him, Cure the sick, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Accordingly, Anthony healed not as one commanding, but by praying and by calling on the name of Christ, so that it was evident to all that he was not the doer, but the Lord who through Anthony showed his love for mankind and healed the suffering. Only the prayer was Anthony's, and the self-denial, for the sake of which he had settled on the mountain, where he rejoiced in the contemplation of divine things. It distressed him, however, that he was troubled by so many people and dragged to the outer mountain, for even all the judges used to ask him to come down from the mountain because it was impossible for them to go in there on account of the litigants who were following them. They asked him to come that they might only see him, 
And when, therefore, he avoided and refused to go to them, they stayed on and sent the prisoners, escorted by soldiers, up to him instead, so that he might come down on their account. At their urging, therefore, and at the sight of the culprits lamenting, he used to go to the outer mountain. Again his trouble was not wasted, for he was a help to many and benefited them by his coming. He helped the judges, counseling them to prefer justice to all else, and to fear God, and to know that with what judgment they judged, they would be judged. Nevertheless, he loved more than all else his dwelling on the mountain. Once, when he was thus importuned by some who were in distress, and the commander had begged him through many messengers to come down, he went down and spoke briefly on the things relating to salvation and on their own needs. He was hastening back when the duke, as he is called, asked him to stay. Anthony said that he could not remain with them longer, and he convinced him by an apt comparison. As fish, if they remain long on dry land, die, he said, so monks who linger among you and spend time with you grow lax. We must therefore hasten to the mountain as the fish to the sea, lest while we linger we forget the inner life. The officer, after hearing this and many other things from him, was amazed, and said that truly this was a servant of God, for how could an unlettered person have such great understanding if he were not beloved of God? There was one officer named Balakios who bitterly persecuted us Christians because of his zeal in behalf of the detestable Arians. Since in his cruelty he was beating virgins and stripping and flogging monks, Anthony sent him a letter containing the following message. I see wrath coming upon you. Cease, therefore, persecuting Christians, lest the wrath at length overtake you, for it is even now imminent. But Balakios laughed, and throwing the letter on the ground, spat upon it. He also insulted the bearers and ordered them to take this message back to Anthony. Since you are concerned about the monks, I shall presently come into you also. Five days had not passed when the wrath overtook him. Balakios and Nestorius, the prefect of Egypt, were going out on horse to the first stopping place from Alexandria, called Kareos. The horses belonged to Balakios and were the quietest of all that he raised. They had not yet reached their destination when the horses began to play with each other, as horses do. Suddenly, the quieter horse, on which Nestorius was riding, threw Balakios and bit him, tearing his thigh so badly with its teeth that he was immediately taken back into the city, where he died within three days. And everyone marveled because Anthony's prediction had been quickly fulfilled. Such was the warning he gave to the cruel. He so instructed others who came to him that they at once forgot their lawsuits and called those blessed who had withdrawn from the world. He so championed those who were wronged that one would think that he himself, not others, was the injured one. He proved such a source of benefit to all that many soldiers and many of the wealthy laid aside the burdens of their life and became monks thereafter. In short, he was a physician, as it were, given to Egypt by God. For who came in sorrow who did not return rejoicing? Who came mourning for his dead and did not quickly put aside his grief? Who came in anger and was not converted to kindliness? Who came weary in his poverty and upon hearing and seeing Anthony did not despise wealth and find consolation in his poverty? What monk grown careless came to him but did not become stronger? What youth came to the mountain, and having seen Anthony, did not straightway renounce pleasure and love self-restraint? Who came to him tempted by the devil, and was not relieved? Who came troubled in thought, and did not gain peace of mind? For this was another remarkable feature of Anthony's asceticism, that having the gift of discerning spirits, as I have said before, he knew their movements and was aware of the object toward which each directed its attention and attack. 
Not only was he himself not trifled with by them, but by encouraging those monks who were troubled in their thoughts, he taught them how they could defeat the tempter's plots by explaining their weakness and wickedness. Thus each one, as though anointed by him for the conflict, went down emboldened against the designs of the devil and his demons. And how many young women who, though they had suitors, seeing Anthony only from a distance, remained virgins for Christ. People came to him from foreign lands also, and having received help with all the others, returned as if sent forth by a father. Since his death, all are like fatherless orphans, comforting each other with only his memory and holding fast to his admonitions and counsels. It is fitting, too, that I tell how he died, and that you listen, since you are eager to hear, for in this also he is worthy of imitation. He was visiting the monks on the outer mountain, as was his custom, and having learned from providence that his end was near, said to the brethren, This is the last visit I shall make to you. I wonder if we shall see each other again in this life. It is time for me to be set free, for I am near a hundred and five years. They wept when they heard this, and embraced the old man and kissed him. But he spoke joyously, as if departing from a foreign city to set out for his own. He exhorted them not to be negligent in their labors, nor to lose heart in their practice of asceticism, but to live as if they were to die daily. They were to be zealous in guarding their souls from foul thoughts, as he had said before, to emulate the saints, and not to go near the Miletian schismatics, for you know their wickedness and profane purpose, he said, and have nothing to do with the Arians, for their impiety is evident to all. Do not be troubled if you see judges protecting them, for it will cease. Their show of power is both mortal and short-lived. Therefore keep yourselves all the more uncontaminated by them, and preserve the tradition of the fathers, and above all, the holy faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, which you have learned from the Scripture, and of which I have often reminded you. When the brethren urged him to remain with them and die there, he refused for many reasons, as he implied by his silence, but for this one in particular. The Egyptians like to perform the funeral rites for the bodies of devout men when they die, especially the holy martyrs, and to wrap them in fine linen. They do not bury them in the earth, but place them on couches and keep them at home with them, thinking in this way to honor the departed. Anthony had often asked the bishops to give orders to the people about this matter, and had likewise shamed laymen and rebuked women saying that this was not lawful, nor at all reverent. The bodies of both the patriarchs and prophets are preserved in tombs even until now, and the very body of the Lord was placed in a tomb, and a stone was placed against and concealed it until he rose on the third day. In saying this, he showed that a man violates the law in not burying the bodies of the dead, even though they be holy. For what is greater or holier than the Lord's body? Many, therefore, after they heard him, thereafter buried their dead in the ground, and thanked the Lord for having been taught rightly. Knowing this custom and fearing that they might treat his body in this manner also, Anthony hastened on, after taking leave of the monks on the outer mountain, and returned to the inner mountain where he usually stayed. He became ill after a few months. Having called those who were with him, there were two who stayed in the house, who had been living the ascetical life for fifteen years and who attended him because of his great age. He said to them, I am going the way of the fathers, as it is written, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Be watchful and do not undo your long practice of asceticism, but be zealous in keeping your resolution as if you were but beginning now. You know how the demons plot against you. You know how fierce they are, yet how feeble in strength. Do not fear them, therefore, but always breathe Christ and trust in Him. 
Live as though dying daily, giving heed to yourself, and remember the counsels you have heard from me. Have no fellowship with the schismatics, nor with the heretical Arians. You know how I also avoided them in view of their false anti-Christian heresy. Be ever more earnest in striving to be united first with the Lord, then with the saints, that after death they also may receive you as familiar friends into everlasting dwellings. Ponder these things and heed them, and if you have any care for me, remember me as a father. Do not permit anyone to take my body to Egypt, lest they should place it in their houses. That is the reason I entered the mountain and came here. You also know how I always reproved those who do this and bade them cease the practice. Therefore, perform the last rites for my body yourselves and bury it in the earth, and observe my request so that no one but you alone may know the place. For at the resurrection of the dead, I shall receive it back incorruptible from the Savior. Divide my garments. Give one sheepskin to Athanasius the bishop, together with the cloak which I used to lie on, which he gave me new, but it has worn out with me. Give the other sheepskin to Serapion the bishop, and you keep the haircloth garment. For the rest, God be with you, children, for Anthony is departing and is with you no more. When he finished speaking and they had embraced him, he raised his feet from the ground. And as if he were looking upon friends coming toward him on whose account he was very glad, for his countenance was joyful as he lay there, he then died and was taken to his fathers. And now, as he had commanded them, they prepared his body and wrapped it up and buried it in the earth and no one to this day knows where it is buried but these two alone. And each of us who received a sheepskin from Blessed Anthony and the cloak that he wore out guards it as a great treasure. Even to look at it is like seeing Anthony as it were, and to wear it is to take up his counsels with great joy. This is the end of Anthony's life in the body as the preceding was the beginning of his life of asceticism, and if these are but insignificant things compared with his virtue, yet judge from them what kind of man Anthony, the man of God, was, who from youth to such great age kept his eagerness for the ascetical life and never yielded to the desire of costly food because of his old age, nor changed the manner of his clothing because of the weakness of his body nor even bathed his feet with water. Yet he remained quite healthy, for he saw well because his eyes were undimmed and sound, and not one of his teeth had fallen out. Only near the gums they had become worn because of the old man's great age. He remained strong both in hands and feet, and altogether he seemed brighter and appeared to have greater physical strength than all those who use various foods and baths and different garments. The fact that he was everywhere spoken of and admired by all, and sought after even by those who had not seen him, is proof of his virtue and of a soul dear to God. For Anthony was not known for his writings, nor for his worldly wisdom, nor for any art, but simply for his reverence toward God. That this was the gift of God no one could deny. For how was he heard of in Spain and in Gaul, how in Rome and in Africa, he sitting on the mountain, if it were not God who everywhere makes known his own people, and who in the beginning had promised this to Anthony also? For though they themselves act in secret, and though they wish to be hidden, the Lord, however, shows them as lamps to all, that even those who thus hear of them may know that the commandments can be fulfilled and that they may acquire zeal for the path of virtue. Read this, therefore, to the other brethren, that they may learn what the life of monks should be, 
and that they may believe that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ glorifies those who glorify Him, and not only leads to the kingdom of heaven those who serve Him to the end, but even here, though they hide themselves and seek to withdraw, He makes them known and spoken of everywhere because of their virtue and the help they gave others. And if there be need, read this to the pagans also, so that perhaps in this manner they too may acknowledge that our Lord Jesus Christ is God and the Son of God, that they may learn also that the Christians, who sincerely worship Him and piously believe in Him, not only prove that the demons whom the Greeks look upon as gods are not gods, but also trample on them and drive them out as deceivers and corrupters of men. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. This has been Life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius of Alexandria, translated by Sister Mary Emily Keenan, S.C.N., narrated by James T. Majewski, Copyright 1952 by the Catholic University of America Press. Production copyright 2020 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by catholicculture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.